But before we open this word, I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be here this morning to be able to worship you. As we come in your presence, we realize all that you've done for us. And now you are calling us as we leave here. This is the training ground. As we leave your church, we go into the mission field, whether it's at the school, whether it's at our workplace, whether it's in our homes. You call us to go and make disciples of all the nations. That's a summons that is given to every person here. But sometimes, Lord, we move forward in fear. And we see the obstacles, we see the struggles, we see what we lack and stay instead of seeing what could be through your power and through your grace. So as we open your word, Lord, give us a vision again of what you can do through each and every one of us, young and old alike. And we thank you in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me if you would. We're going to be looking at several passages this morning. So If you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible in front of you, uh, in your pews. We're going to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, which is our scripture reading this morning. When we come to the 17th chapter, the Bible says that the Philistines and the Israelites were gathered in the valley of Elah in order to engage in battle. The Israelites were on one slope, The Philistines were on the other. At the bottom of the ravine was what many archaeologists have called a wadi, which is a small riverbed where, in fact, David had found his stones for his sling. The river was practically impassable to pass except at a few spots. So if any of the soldiers began making their way through the water, they put themselves in a very dangerous position, a very vulnerable place. And so they were reluctant. The one side was reluctant to attack the other. So finally, after several days, the Philistines presented a challenge to the Israelites, one that they felt pretty confident about. And we pick up the story here, starting in verse 4 of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Please read along with me, if you would. It says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was, I'm sorry, armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like the weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and his shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Clearly, friends, Goliath was not your typical soldier by any means. Can you say amen this morning? The Bible says that he was six cubits and a span in height. Now, if we translated that into modern terms, Goliath was somewhere around nine feet, six inches tall. He was an enormous man. Now, if you added the height of the length of his arms when he lifted them over his head, then you would probably add another four to five feet to his stature. Folks, you could just imagine what an opposing creature Goliath was on the battlefield. The NBA would have really loved him on the court, wouldn't Wouldn't they? Look at what he was wearing. First, the Bible says he wore a coat of mail. To make a coat of mail, a seamstress would have to sew strips of metal two to eight inches long and sew them on a leather leather garment, and the garment went from the shoulder to the knee, thus protecting the soldier from the enemy. Next, the Bible says that the coat weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze, which was anywhere between 175 and 200 pounds, which was quite a, a lot of weight to carry on your body. 
Third, the Bible says that he wore a bronze helmet and bronze greaves. Greaves are the strips of metal that are used to protect the shin. Fourth, the Bible says that Goliath carried a bronze javelin or spear between his shoulders. The head of the spear alone weighed 25 pounds. And to top it off, the Bible says that Goliath had someone who would be his shield bearer. Friends, when you read these verses, do we not get the sense from the biblical writer that Goliath was a giant nearly impossible to defeat? From a human perspective, it seemed as though that victory was not possible. In fact, look at how Saul and his army responded when they heard the challenge of Goliath. Look at verse 11. When Paul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. From an earthly perspective, it seemed as though the giant was too big, too strong to ever defeat. I wonder this morning, have you ever faced such giants in your life? Problems, obstacles that seem so big, so overwhelming that they just seem to want to crush you? Looking back over on my life, I know that there's been times when I have faced such challenges in my life. And let me tell you, it's not a pleasant place to be in either, is it? It seems that these challenges just want to suck the life out of you. And you don't feel like you can go any further. How would God want us to face such issues How would God want us to relate to the giants that lie before us? Well, friends, I believe that we can find our answer as we continue on in the story. God was going to work in a miraculous way. He was going to use something that the world cannot understand, that the world cannot relate to, that society can never connect with. He was going to use a simple thing called faith. Faith can move the world for God. Notice as we read on in the story, look at verse 17. We see now that David, a young shepherd boy, he enters into the picture, and David was really the giant of the day. Verse 17, the Jesse said to his son David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, And run to your brothers at the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousands, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David arose. He never knew what that day held for him. He never knew in advance. So David arose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things, and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. He's being a good, obedient young brother. Then verse 23, then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Here David was standing talking to his brothers. When all of a sudden he heard this maddening cry from across the ravine. Instantly, like mice when frightened by the appearance of a cat, every soldier ran around David and they climbed into their tents afraid. Keep in mind, this was the first time that David had heard this cry. The soldiers had been listening to it for the last 40 days and maybe over time their courage became weakened. David looked across the battlefield And he saw this huge creature of a man covered with brass armor. He saw him standing at the base of the valley shouting curses toward the God of Israel. And when David heard Goliath, something stirred inside of him. There was a reaction that maybe David did not have before. His emotions got all stirred up. And look at verse 26. 
Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Go, David. Amen? David thought to himself, No one is going to talk about my God that way. No one is going to get by without punishment for cursing my God. This ought not to be. And surprised by what he heard, David began to inquire about the situation a little bit more. And before long, his oldest brother Eliab got word of all the commotion that he was stirring up. And so he came to his younger brother to try to put him in his place. Verse 28, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. What a nice brother, wouldn't you say? Friends, do you get a little picture of why Eliab was not chosen to be the next king of Israel? We get a glimpse of his character. His character disqualified him to sit on the throne. Because not only did he question David's motive, but he actually said David was a self-seeking sinner, which was far from the case. Because we just read in the previous chapter last Sabbath, we saw that when God looked at David and saw his young heart, he saw that his heart was right with him. You know, it's interesting how we can see our own guilt and sin vicariously through someone else. How easy it is to be critical of somebody else instead of facing the facts about ourselves. Let me ask you, who really had the wicked heart? It wasn't David. It was Eliab, the older brother. Now, notice that What David asked next, and this is what has intrigued me greatly this last week as I was preparing for this message. Notice what, you may not have seen this before, but notice David's question that he poses to his brother. Verse 29, and David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause Notice the response of David versus the Israelite men. For the last 40 40 days, the Israelite army had cowered in fear because all they could see that lay before them was this massive giant, and this giant frightened them, this giant scared them, this giant laughed at their God. But in contrast, David, once he came upon the scene, he saw the challenge before him. And he knew in his mind to attack Israel was to rage war against God. To badmouth Israel was to insult God. To belittle Israel would be to belittle the creator of heaven and earth. Knowing what was at stake, David asked the question, is there not a cause? Such a question stems from passion. Passion is what compels us to champion something. It compels us to trumpet it, to stand behind it. Passion is having a purpose, a reason for being. Passion is having a crusade to work with and a mission to die for. Without a cause or a passion, our life is very empty. There is no zeal in our life. So I ask the question, what is your passion this morning? What is your cause? What are you living for? What is your purpose in life? What drives you? What motivates you? Is it God? Is it his character? Is it his will? Is it his work? We have all have some area that we follow, but is it always the right one? I would like to suggest this morning that our passion must be the cause of God. We live in an age 
that is working directly against God and his truths. And as a church, as we see what is happening around us, many times we hide in our tents in fear due to the overwhelming pressure of society. And friends, God needs you and he needs me. There is a dying world out there who needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to know that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and by believing in him, they can have eternal life. And God is waiting for us to be messengers of his grace. Is there not a cause to be passionate about? Is there not a cause that we're willing to die for? Is there not a cause that compels us to give our lives, our resources, our time, our talent? Is there not a cause? Now, as we read on in the story, we see that the scene suddenly changes from David and Eliab to David and Saul. Look at verse 31. It gets very interesting as we read on in the story. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Don't you just love that? Here's this teenage boy. He's a young shepherd. He's never been in a battle with all these other armies. And he goes to the seasoned, hardened king, King Saul. And he encourages him to fight in the battle. Can you imagine? Verse 33 And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. David, my son, you're just a boy. You're just a teenager. Look out there. He's a giant. He's a monster. He'll destroy you in a moment's time. David just looked at him straight in the eyes. And he said, oh, king, what giant are you talking about? The only giant that I know is my God. That's a dwarf that's out there. If my God enabled me to slay a lion, if he helped me with my own hands to kill a bear, if he helped me to do all of these things, there's nothing that my God cannot do. Oh, church members, never discount the abilities and passion of our youth. Just as God has done many times before, he will work through the youth to finish his work on earth. Which is why we need to give opportunities to youth to serve in ministry. They need to be part of the process, need to be part of the decision-making that takes place. And the youth that are here today, Never discount yourself either. What can I do? I'm just a teenager. I don't have the experience. I don't have the money. I don't have the talents. How can I really make a difference for God? Can I really do something? I would like to say this morning that God will use anyone, young and old alike, who is committed to him, that has realized that there is a cause to live for, that there is a mission to die for. Do you realize that when the Adventist church first started, the early leaders were teenagers, 17, 18 years old? And look what happened. Today, we have 20 million in membership. Praise God. We have a presence in 205 of the 210 countries of the world, and it all came about because there were young people who were committed to God and his cause. They knew that there was a cause to live for and a cause to die for. And he's calling us to have that same passion today. Amazed by his courage, and to be honest, to kind of get himself off the hook, Saul agreed to let David fight Goliath. In fact, he offered his own armor, which was a ridiculous gesture on his part. I mean, Saul was much taller than David, and David was much smaller than Saul as well. It weighed the, the armor weighed too much that it bogged David down. 
And the Bible says that David stripped all the armor off of his body, which is really a symbol of stripping himself of all human efforts and all human resources. All he had left were a few small stones, a sling, and a great faith in his God. But that's all he needed, wasn't it? David was now ready to fight Goliath. And notice the Bible mentions what took place starting in verse 40. Please read with me. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five small stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, and the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with the sword, with the spear, and with the javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who have def- you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you, and I will take your head from you. Verse 47, Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was when Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and slung it and struck it, the Philistine in his forehead. So the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. Quite an account, wouldn't you say? As I was preparing this message, I read somewhere where some had done some research on the size of David's stones. Sometimes we think that they're small, they're the size of marbles. That wasn't the case at all. Many were as large as tennis balls, Slingers back in Bible times had the ability to throw such rocks with great accuracy. The average speed of a rock thrown in a sling was over 100 miles an hour. So picture the scene. As David walked to the base of the canyon, he reached down and grabbed five stones. Why five? Was it a lack of faith? Remember, Goliath had other brothers. David then started racing towards the giant with sling in hand, and Goliath was amazed that they had sent a youth to fight him. Filled with rage, he pushed up the lip of the helmet that protected his forehead and rushed forward to wreak vengeance upon his opponent. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and began to swing the stone round and around in his sling. And as he pressed forward, he released the stone at the precise moment. And the stone whizzed through the air, 100 miles an hour. And it hit Goliath at the frontal part of his skull, and it crushed it. And it sank deep into his forehead. Goliath literally didn't know when it hit him. The mighty warrior, he held his hands over his face and he screamed with pain. He reeled and staggered and and like a mighty stricken oak tree, he collapsed to the ground. The ground shook. David didn't hesitate. He rushed over without a moment's hesitation. He grabbed Goliath's own sword, the same one that was intended for him, and severed the head of the giant. Can't you just visualize the reaction of all the onlookers? Everyone was just stunned. I mean, here was a boy. He had no armor whatsoever, and suddenly before them they see this mighty giant collapse before their eyes. You would have been stunned, and I would have been stunned. 
The Philistines ran in fear, wondering who was this God that brought great victory to Israel. What a story. Stories don't get any better than the story of David and Goliath. I wonder, friends, why do you think God included this story in the Scriptures? Why would God use a little boy like David to conquer a mighty giant like Goliath? Well, I think that God wants us to understand important truths about how he works. I'd like to mention them real quickly as we move towards closing. The lesson that we can learn, first one, is that each of us will face giants in our life. All of us will. As already mentioned, we cannot avoid these trials. The key is how do you overcome the giants in our lives? Number two, fear often keeps us from moving forward and fulfilling God's plan. All the Israelite soldiers were hiding in their tents because of fear. But it took the courage of a young boy by the name of David who was willing to go out on the battlefield in faith and fight for the Lord. Friends, I believe that in the trials and the, the struggles of life, we are to keep our eyes not on the horizontal, but on the vertical. To know that it's God who will bring the victory. The third truth that we can learn is that God uses the simple thing of faith to confound the wise. Too often we rely on our own arsenal, our own tools, our own financial uh, benefits and people that we know. But sometimes God brings us, oftentimes, God brings us to the place where none of those things work anymore. And so that when we trust in God, when victory comes, he alone will receive the praise, glory, and honor. He strips us of all the human resources, and we have to rely on the creator God. Fourthly, God will use anyone in his work who was willing to be used. To think that God used a 15-year-old to conquer the giant. When I look out in our midst this morning, there are many Davids, many Josephs, many Marys that God can use for his kingdom. God wants to work through you and he wants to work with me, young and old alike, to finish his work on earth. And the fifth thing that we can learn that when we face the giants in our lives, the battles we face are the Lord's. We cannot bring about victory in our own. We can, our, our own human abilities and talents, they will cause us to stumble and fall many times. Instead, we are to turn them over to the Lord, what do you say? It is he that will win the battle for us. As David says, the battle is the Lord's, and he will give victory into my hands. So friends, I wonder this morning, I don't know what your intimidating giant may be right now. My guess is that we're all facing something in our lives. Some of you may be facing a struggle at your job, and you're wondering what to do next. Some of you may be dealing with some pressures of school, and you're wondering how you can make it the next week, and the, and the tests and the quizzes and the papers are all mounting and getting higher and higher. And there may be others here who are dealing with an issue at home or with a friend. Whatever you're facing, you may be dealing with something that seems so overwhelming, that seems so heavy, that it's just taking the life out of you. God is saying to you and me today, don't be afraid. Don't give up. All we need to do is grab one of those small stones and put it in the, faith, put it in the sling of faith. And to know that God says to us, trust me, I will take care of it. You don't have to rely on your own power, your own skills, your own abilities. He says, just trust me, I can take care of that giant in your life. It's no problem with me. Just turn it over to me. Are you willing to let go and let God work this morning? I don't know about you, but I'm tired of defeat. And I'm tired of failure. 
Let us stop trying to do the battles ourselves and rely on God's power. Friends, there is a world to reach. There is a cause to die for. Don't let the giants in our lives stop us from accomplishing God's purpose in these last days. Satan will want those trials to paralyze you to the point that we'll hide in our tents and that the gain of the enemy will get greater, the ground will get greater. Friends, let's move forward in faith, what do you say? And whatever burden you may have, let's put it before the altar, put it before Jesus. It's his battle. Victory will come through his power. I love this poem as we conclude. Doubt sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night. Faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. Doubt questions who believes. Faith answers, I, Lord, it's I. Do you want to have the faith of David this morning? If so, just raise your hand as we close. Heavenly Father, there is a cause to die for. There is a world to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all we see oftentimes are the giants before us. I don't have the talents, Lord. I don't have the resources. Look, there's so many out there that don't believe you. Why should we bother anymore? Lord, help us to move forward in faith. There are many Davids, many Marys, many Josephs in our midst. Oh God, I pray that we'll be moved with passion. Passion is what shakes the world for you. Passion is what moves us from the pew to the world. Passion is what moves us from what we may do on a normal day-to-day and moves us to sacrifice and to give all for your work. I pray that we'll be the Davids of our day. And Lord, help us to realize it's your battle, not ours. The victory will come through a simple thing called faith. Faith in the Almighty God. Help us, Lord. Help us in our walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.